Good afternoon. Welcome. I'm, D I'm Kimberly Hollister. I'm Dean of the Feliciano School of Business, and I am so pleased to be here today with you to introduce our very special guests, um, Don Katz, founder of Audible and Newark Venture Partners, and Dennis Bone, former president of New Jersey Verizon and a member of the university's foundation board and the School of Business's board. Before I introduce, ask Dennis to introduce Don, I want to just send a couple of thank yous out there. Um, this event was put together in collaboration with the dean's offices in the College of Humanities and Social Sciences, the School of Business, as well as the College of the Arts and the School of Communications, um, the Graduate Programs Department in the Business School and our MBA office. So a lot of much appreciation to all of them for putting this together. Um, following Don and Dennis's conversation, um, Don's going to take some questions from the audience, so think about those now. And we hope that you can stay for a brief reception that's going to be held just upstairs on the second floor. Um, so for now, I'll hand this over to uh, my great friend, uh, Dennis Bone. Okay. <clears throat> Thank you, Kimberly. I really appreciate that introduction. And good morning, afternoon. It's not morning. Good afternoon, everyone. I am delighted to be here and share the stage with Don Katz, the true Renaissance man and visionary who continues to bring his powers of innovation and leadership to his pursuit of equal opportunity and community transformation. As you know, Don founded Audible the leading creator and provider of premium audio storytelling nearly 30 years ago. Don's goal was to build a new medium that would re redefine and enhance the nature of spoken information, education, entre entertainment, and other modes of expression. Audible, first product, was, portable, was a portable media player that was predated the iPod by four years. Today, Audible is part of Amazon and serves millions of customers worldwide. And over 800,000 dan dan downloadable audiobooks and, audio audio boy and Audible uh, organized, including originated theater, mass uh, music, conversations with artists and performers, as well as podcasts. In 2007, the company established its headquarters in Newark, a move that symbolized Don's abiding commitment to the city's revitalization. In 2015, Don founded Newark Venture Partners, a, a social impact investment fund and accelerator that seeks to connect Newark to the early stage technology startup innovation economy. And before founding Audible, Don was an accomplished journalist, an award-winning author of several nonfiction books and a contributing editor at Rolling Stone, Esquire, and other publications. He has been recognized as one of America's top 25 disruptive leaders and New Jersey's most influential tech leader, among other distinctions. Don graduated from New York University and holds a master's in economics from the London School of Economics and Political Science. And Don, I hear you're pretty good with a hockey stick in your hand. <laughs> Please join me in welcoming Don Katz. Hi, everybody. So I need to say I was good at hockey. I do play it. All, I'm on this campus. I've been on the campus probably twice a week for, since, 19, since uh, the arena opened. And now I really suck at hockey. But I'm still <laughs> out there. And uh, I, I love that rink. Um, so I'm going to start with a little, uh, for those to the students here thinking um, maybe a, sh a show of hands. Like how many people at some point have had the Audible app on their phone? That's a lot of people and kind of goes with the kind of numbers that, uh, that uh, it, it, it became. But how many people know that Audible was invented only two miles from here? 
ooh, okay, that's really interesting. So that's worth like, conveying. So, uh, so <laughs> I've lived in Montclair since 1989 when we moved from the city. Um, and uh, uh, in the, you know, we, we, it was a long, we basically got very involved with, um, you know, with the town, um, you know, in the, uh, and the, the really it's interesting, I actually helped the public library in Montclair uh, raise a historic amount of money when I was on the library board there. And it was an experience as a, as a writer, which is pretty much a lone wolf life, um, that I realized I was pretty good at raising a lot of money and galvanizing things, you know, with the teams of people, and I liked the project orientation, very different than being, being a writer. And it kind of was empowered the kind of vision of, of changing my life and coming to Audible, but Audible came out of my third floor attic away at the south of town, below the public library, and then the company's first um, office was on South Fullerton, across from Immaculate Conception, in a doctor's office. And, uh, and I actually wanted, thought it would be cool to kind of build the company here. Obviously, would have outgrown it at some point. But, um, but we ended up uh, going out to the Willowbrook Mall, to one of those buildings you see that looks like it's in an Appalachian floodplain when you go over the <laughs> bridge whenever it rains. Uh, so it's, it's been a, and it was, you know, the, it is true that the first digital audio player, which is in the Smithsonian, was basically invented out of you know, this, um, this town and community. And one of the first things I did was uh, I raided Bell Labs, going back to things that Dennis and I have in common, and basically got an amazing amount of rocket scientist level people out um, who were excited to come build something that we, that we would see the light of day because it had become sort of an academic environment where lots of people were doing studies and things that weren't, weren't turning into products. Um, I guess, given all the, the, the talent here in terms of the, the, the students I see, um, I do want to say that I, I had two careers, um, and they were both based on taking ideas and then turning them into reality, often pretty unlikely ideas by the analysis, not just of me, but people around me who sometimes you know, are the gatekeepers on, on what happens to ideas. But it often was the reason I think I was, I lived that way and thought that way was the character of having a really broad education. I just had one of those high school, college, and grad school experiences where I just kind of sucked in everything I could. And the biggest thing that happened to me was along the way I had the caring of really great teachers who really were transformative for me. I mean, I've said this often, but you really can't discount the power of an individual teacher's of, um, impact on the course and the character of your life. And when I talk to kids, particularly you know, the Newark people, people who are actually they're in their families very first to have levels of different kinds of degrees, I always basically said, I you know, wrote a book about Nike and in the days of you know, Charles Barkley and Michael you know, Jordan saying, you know, follow your dreams and stuff. And the truth is, that, that's just a nebulous concept. I basically would say, this quarter, this semester, find somebody who's going to care what happens to you and make them actually be, and a lot of it's got to be, you know, you also have to be interested in who they are. Why are they teachers? They're, you know, they're people. They're not just, uh, you know, people giving you grades. And it's, I think it's that, that's the kind of thing that I, I did. And, um, and I, th I think that, um, the other thing I'd just say is that not all the courses you take need to be directly applicable to how you want to get a job or make money. It's often the case that the most successful people, and now, of course, I've seen the, the work of, frankly, thousands of people because of leading Audible for all those years. A lot of the people, you know, they knew how to write well, even though they were in a technology company. The other people were incredible at just basic data science and numbers crunching, even though they were in roles that weren't, you know, directly um, ab about that. And, you know, I was an English major with a poli-sci minor when I was an undergraduate, but I studied, you know, when I, I mean, there were philosophy courses and really big urban studies courses and things that really gave me this sense of feeling like a lot of the things I would or could do didn't need to be absolutely linear to some specific job. And the other problem is, if you're like a freshman in college, half the time, given what's going on now, the job and the situation has changed by the time you, know, you get out. So 
you know, who gets hired, what you get paid, everything you know, has been, been changing. Um, but for me, it was, uh, I had a run as a writer instead of 20 years, and I was a very serious writer and, and journalist and took advantage, I worked around the clock just like I did when I was starting Audible. But it was, it, people seem surprised, but my last year as a writer versus my first year when I started Audible, I took a 75% income cut from uh, going from writing, which now people, you know, it's not a fantastic way to make a living now, which is a whole other subject, but, um, you know, in terms of money um, to write, but um, in that case, you know, I, that was my, my experience of it. And also, it allowed me to go out and say to all these other people, like, yeah, leave your perfectly good jobs with this crazy idea I have and follow me. And you don't have to take a 75% pay cut, but you have to take 50, and here's a whole bunch of stock options and things that you can, who knows, maybe someday they'll, they'll be worth something. Um, but the other message I just want to say is that as long as you can eat, um, and the stresses are not, you know, based about real basic, you know, making ends meet, um, you do have a lot of time. And so the message for me, I was 43 when I started Audible. So, and there's a lot of evidence actually that people who started companies that my age have much higher success rate than what you think of as the young garage guys from Silicon Valley. And um, it's, it's really interesting to think about, because you know, you think of Gates and Zuckerberg and you know, all these people who know what they want to do and drop out of school and you know, um, to do their startups, which is, which is fine. And some of them obviously, you know, do great, but you, do, but you don't have to. But anyways, Audible is, uh, you know, way beyond anything I probably imagined at the beginning. I mean, it's just tens of millions of people are probably using it now. It's in 180 countries. It's in 47 languages. There, when when um, Audible went public on the stock market in 1999, which was a whole era of companies that weren't really quite real yet going public, um, there were only 3,000 audiobooks, and uh, so what I kind of wanted to do, which Dennis and I can, can get into, it was change that, and now there's like 900,000 titles in English that you can get and listen to across, way beyond audiobooks, all sorts of original programming and stuff. So anyways, with that, um, get with Dennis, I'll come back up and uh, see what you guys want to hear about. Great. Thanks. We are in the bright light. I know. That's great. <laughs> oh, <clears throat> uh, thanks for sharing uh, with what you just shared. That was amazing. That was really good. Nice. And hopefully uh, students and everybody here uh, can take some, uh, <coughs> you know, something good out of that. Uh, let me start. I only have a few uh, uh, questions here that I want to ask uh, Don. And first one is, and you've touched base on this, before you became the founder of Audible, you had a successful career as a journalist. Can you tell us the origin story of Audible and what inspired you to take that leap? Sure. So uh, it, I'd, I'd always written these, you are there inside the head of kinds of articles, Rolling Stone, you know, kind of that kind of journalism. Or I wrote journal-like articles of magazines that really were a big deal when I was Young, like the New Republic and things like that. So, but I always would come up with that other the idea was. And then um, after I'd written a couple of books, uh, someone came to me and with an idea that wasn't my own idea, I should have known. But what ha it was, and the idea was to write a book about the digital media revolution, what was going to happen in the future. And, um, and it was kind of nebulous. I couldn't, and so, you know, I did talk to. Um, you know, I, I, I kind of looked at it. I switched my column in Esquire from the business column, which I wrote throughout the 80s. My whole thing was like teach the baby boom generation, my generation, about things they didn't know about. And money was clearly something that we all avoided like crazy. It was just amazing how, you know, we just decided that it was beneath us in our counterculture ways is what, you know, to do it. So, so um, the, the, but as I went in, I, looked, I, I, I spent time with Ray Smith. <laughs> and Bill Gates, and the whole idea was, 
Someday we're going to figure out how to take the telephony industry, the computer industry, and all of media and merge it into this vast interactive whole. The problem was that nobody had any idea what that meant. Um, and you know the phone lines were there, but that and then there was this idea of the internet from the government. So it was just so early. Anyway, long story short, I never wrote the book. And um, and actually, after the, the the stock market crash, which people forget about, of April 2000, that's when they came back and wanted the money back from the advance on the book. So I ended up on a on a payment system. I had no, no money at all, you know, to give it back. So that's where it came from, basically. But there's always more than that. When, when you find out companies that succeed, the origin stories, there's never one. It, I mean, it, it, it usually is a lot of things coming together. And for me, it was probably more time than we have. Just so many things did come together. And part of it was that um, I, I reunited with my college roommate, um, who I'd taken computer courses just so I could talk to. And we were friends. And, but he'd gone off and gotten a PhD and had a uh, was a supercomputer designer. And I, we kind of imagined this reality that I so said, what if this, these phone lines that you could fit, um, the, you could fit a file through it that could be um, you know, spoken word audio? And, uh, and I'd been obsessed with spoken word audio in general because my teacher at NYU was Ralph Ellison, the great American novelist. And he was basically launched the ideas behind both my lives as a writer and as an entrepreneur. And so I knew that American literature sounded like it did and it, when Mark Twain wrote it or Stephen Crane wrote it because of the oral traditions. It really wasn't our textual traditions, which was more what the Brits were about. So I always had this sense that there was a lot of integrity to listening to well-composed words. You know, so I had that cultural background. And then there were things like my, my daughter was a very successful teacher and adult, but she had learning processing challenges. Back then, everything was called dyslexia. And I knew how audio and audio tracking with, with text together had broken through and caused her to be an amazing student and you know, a dual master's in you know, early intervention and education from Bank Street and things like that. So that was in the background. There were a lot of things that kind of came in. And I think the other thing was just that I'd written a book called Home Fires. I didn't realize this until after I'd started Audible. Um, and I think in subconsciously, unconsciously, it was the best execution of that whole world of, of, of storytelling that you know I was kind of writing these, whether it was 12,000 word articles, I mean, you never see that anymore. And uh, you know, or these real, my books, my first two books were 550 and 600 pages, and they took me five years and six years respectively. So I think the one book was, I think it was as good as I could do it. And um, I think subconsciously it freed me up, you know, like the athletes who never do this, but you know, like stopping at the top. I think it freed me up psychologically to try something completely uh, different. And there's other things in there. Um, um, there's my father suddenly died uh, when I was in college. And, uh, and he was an entrepreneur. And there's a lot of also studies that uh, fatherlessness is a component of a lot of driven entrepreneurial kind of types. And there's lots of reasons for that. And I think that was probably part of my, you know, my experience too. But you know, I, um, I, I, I think it's a, uh, um, the other thing I just got to mention is that um, I was the kind of writer where what I wanted to surface was what does it mean to be willing to die for a cause in, as an Ethiopian revolutionary or a Red Brigade terrorist and, and the like. And so this idea of like what does it mean really was how that kind of journalism transcended like newspaper journalism for the, the comms people here. You know, there's a, there still is a very kind of more the newspaper article and you know, the fact-based versus the storytelling you know, literary narrative. It's, it's very different. And I think this idea of what, can, what does it mean then transferred into Audible's culture because the, the people principles I finally wrote in 2017, and I, we talk about why I refused to do it before that, but um, uh, uh, it, the idea was like, uh, how, what can a company mean in ways that transcend what it does? So the truth is Audible is pretty much different from a lot of, a lot of businesses for the business students here. They're, 
they're usually optimizations on pro the productivity. Uh, you get, so Uber, you get from here to here, you just get there better, faster, cheaper, or it was cheaper, um, and you know, than, than a taxi. So, um, and then a lot of other things are just literally technical improvements on something that was. It's pretty rare, but sometimes there are these things that kind of come from the, the blue, like Audible, which had a whole category to create. Like, let's make the spoken word a, a discernible media type in America next to all of film and TV, music, and books. And that's kind of a different idea. And I think one of the reasons, and I'll shut up, you can ask me another question, but um, that um, I, as a journalist, I got to spend some time with an amazing American who some people remember, but others probably should, is named W. Edwards Deming. And Deming uh, is a god in Japan because he was a statistician who was this genius guy who basically developed the, co the concepts around quality, total quality management and stuff, TQ and things like that that you know, people kind of study now but in different formats. Um, but he also was an amazing student on the idea of inventing before they ask which is one of the audible kind of tenets, which is very different. He could like say, no one asked for the air conditioner. No one asked for the, um, no one asked for the uh, pneumatic tire. And he could go through history of things where people connected six dots and saw some opportunity. And these, to him, were the kind of breakout things that she had in, you know, historical inflection points. And everything else was more, um, and, and, you know, it's, uh, for years, with particularly people who studied business, you're kind of taught to solve the customer problem um, because you then have to identify the problem, and then you have some efficiency-based solution to it. Um, but that's different than inventing a, something from whole cloth. So I think that you know, I had a lot of, I guess that's a roundabout way of saying that a lot of stuff goes into it, but a lot of it's also just friggin' luck. <laughs> it just is. I mean, the timing. Um, Time, you know, my timing was really bad at various points and really good at other points. But um, you know, you, 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 there's a reason that you know a lot of successful entrepreneurs have tried it, you know, two and three times before and learned from the the things that didn't work. We say that to everyone. <clears throat> You're often called and even honored for being a disruptor. Do you like that descriptor? And what does it mean to you? It's a really good question because it's one of those terms that, like so many terms, gets kind of hijacked and then applied to, you know, to anything. And um, and it's also at this point a little bit demonized because the tech community is not at the top of its game when it comes to you know being seen as being ethical or cool or anything. I mean, it's, it, things blooms go off the road. So I I did consistently use the concept of being positively disruptive. Which is different, so because you know disruptive means you know you could be, um, you know, and so so I think what Clayton Christ Christensen kind of meant was that um, out of the tech world there would be these transformative changes which would disrupt the status quo. Then that the truth is, I'm all about challenging the status quo. I probably don't use the word disruptive much just because of the way it's been knocked around, um, but it is true that. Um, you know, things like generational poverty is a design status quo. So you're not going to change it by giving money to the boys' club, which we talked about, and Sam Dagalva and I talked about for years. It's just, you know, it's unfortunate. But um, the corporate, the big corporate thinking around, you know, uh, equanimity, quality, fairness, and stuff like that was very much changed in the 1980s by a guy named Milton Friedman kind of coming out of... Uh, literally a cave, and to, to become somebody who had the you know the the moral philosophy for corporations, which was just make money for your shareholders, and that was it. And it wasn't that way before. You know, if you look at the Marshall Plan, I mean, the, you know, the, the private sector was very much about how to actually pour money into Europe after they after World War II and things like that. So, but at that point, it just became easy to perpetuate the status quo by just hiring somebody to go to galas and giving money to the local nonprofit. So um, the big thing when Audible moved to Newark, and incidentally, moved to Newark in 2007, I thought by taking a company thought to be cool with a great brand, it was already you know, becoming a really big, successful company, 
that other companies would follow because you'd want to be an urban pioneer, you want to be part of a turnaround, all this kind of stuff. That's not the trend. It's like it didn't, you know, most companies still, either they were there for 40 or 50 years already and never moved, and almost everybody who works there probably has never even eaten, eaten in a restaurant in New York. It's like, it's, it's sad, but the, you know, the, the, the corporations there often don't engage the community in a, in a very, very big way. So when we went into Newark, I just said, as part of this, what can a company mean? Like, we're going to um, not do arm's length philanthropy. We're going to figure out direct programs to develop that have some replicability that could then have some impact on, you know, this, this amazing city with these amazing people. I mean, the fact is, Newark is cool. I mean, there are people there. Families that, I mean, you just can't believe how much I, I've benefited from getting to know the people of Newark. And then the history of the thing. I mean, you, I mean half the people who've made American jazz and blues are from Newark. The, you know, the, the quality of invention there. I mean, it wasn't just Edison being there in the old days. It's like commercial plastic, commercial radio. Um, the, the guts of the air conditioner all came out of, the carrier all came out of Newark. And um, it's a glorious kind of history. It just was, you know, historically massively injured by, you know, forces we know now was, were not wholly accidental. Right. Uh, <clears throat> just to stick with uh, Newark for a minute. Uh, so you've done a lot, and your company's done a lot in Newark. Um, so can you tell us a little bit about that journey? of how you went from just knowing, yeah. first knowing, uh, uh, and then coming out with this great uh, organization. It's even yeah. so much better. On the Newark side of things. Right. Um, yeah, so, well, I, had, I was Newarkized and kind of began to, you know, frankly, take my focus and even my wife's focus away from Montclair and take it over to Newark because <laughs> it was just a, a better place to seem to, you know, to make change. Uh, um, so I, I, going way back, uh, I, uh, another Chicago guy um, I've known for years, also an ex-journalist named Norman Atkins, um, who'd started the Robin Hood Foundation, which is a really substantial um, foundation. Um, he, he went back to learn, you know, to principal school and basically decided to focus on education. And, he's, and I was there with him as the first board member sitting at what would become North Star Academy um, in, in Newark. Uh, and this is from the beginning, it was mostly public school teachers, and they were going to use this new way of funding schools through charters. And so, you know, I was kind of there at the beginning of, of, of trying to change the quality of education in the, in the city. Um, and so then the other thing is I did meet a law student around the same time who told me he was going to become a, a, a machine, he was going to unseat the machine politicians of Newark. He was a Yale law student, and I, after the after the dinner, I said to my, my wife, I said, that Cory Booker's a nice guy, but he's going to be an investment banker in a, in a minute. And, uh, and he proved me wrong. So, so I had kind of those involvements. But I, I really had decided I was really tired of being a, a Montclair liberal supporting you know, people in Newark and actually go there. So we, so we moved. First thing we did is just said, no more nepotistic internships. You, you have to be a kid from Newark or educated in Newark. To, to be an audible intern, and you're going to get paid you know, a decent wage. No, none of these exploitative internships that the media companies were really good at, you know, having no, no you know, not paying, which you know, meant that you know, people coming from you know, lower income environments couldn't do it because uh, you know, they, weren't, they weren't paying. Um, so, so, so we changed that, and, and it was just amazing uh, to see the impact of these amazing kids coming into a culture. So at its best, Audible had, you know, a lot of English majors like me turned into business people, lots of the most sophisticated technologists, frankly, in the world working there. We were the largest employer of actors in the New York area. So there's all these actors kind of running around. And then there's these amazing kids. And it was like, I thought, well, this is much cooler than, you know, working at ABC Corporation or a bank or something. So it was always just, it was a lot of payback. But from there, I, I became chairman of the Economic Development Corporation. I saw some of the, you know, why some of the public policies, you know, um, were just perpetuating the, the lack of change. I mean, childhood health in Newark is still an absolute, um, 
it's, it's an immoral tragedy. I mean, the, the kids live, on average, significantly less long lives than kids in Bloomfield or in God knows Manhattan. It's almost 12 or 15 years. I mean, it's not okay um, because the people who are really poor just haven't been given a chance. So, you know, sitting there thinking that putting a building up, you know, was, was kind of going to change anything. So we sort of tried to do lots of, you know, different things. And some of the programs um, were, um, you know, and the idea was what could the company, using its inventiveness, so you, you have these companies that are often quite inventive to get where they go, but they don't apply their inventiveness to, to um, you know, to the, the cities or the, or the social inequities that around you, except for just sending a check to the charity. Martin Luther King, 63, said, uh, uh, you know, charity is commendable, but if it, um, if it masks the economic circumstances that cause the need for charity, nothing's going to change. And so, you know, that, clear, that was kind of where we just tried to do a bunch of stuff. And, you know, Newark Venture Partners was, you know, it's, it's complicated because COVID has really put a hit into particularly the cities with historical challenges and stuff. But Newark Venture Partners, believe it or not, was if, if these amazing Audible interns who became Audible scholars and would get automatic jobs and they could come back and, and work at Audible. I, I can't probably hire them all, you know, even though I would love to, um, and probably some of them won't, won't want to come back. But it was, it was really clear that what, if you were a smart kid from Newark for years, um, you would often get picked out and then lifted out to a prep school and to get you out. And, I thought, wait a minute, if they don't come back, um, you're robbing the city of this amazing intellectual capital of these K-12 scholars and really sophisticated people. Um, so Newark Venture Partners was to plant a lot of little audibles, because I didn't think there were enough cool companies um, down Broad Street, which I think you probably would agree, <laughs> um, for, to, that, a, that a cool kid like that would want to come back and work there. So I just thought that there would be sort of a replenishment um, through Newark Venture Partners. And there are other things that, you know, are the other corporations are um, nonsensical. So it said, Let, let's pay any young employee, not even young, any employee who moved to Newark who didn't live there and, or did already will pay $500 a month uh, after taxes uh, rent deferment. Um, and like, I remember a couple of the HR people and people I've known for, you know, saying, why are you always trying to? you know, make us look bad. I said, no, this is going to work. And so it turned out that the metrics showed that those employees were more productive. They usually had each drafted somebody away from Google or Facebook, you know, of course, with their palatial places in the city to come be part of the, you know, this pioneer turnaround environment and be part of a cooler company. And they each uh, put at least a hundred and some thousand dollars in the local economy in ways that you could measure in, you know, job retention and, and things like that. So. So those were the kind of things that, um, that, that, you know, that, that kind of set up that, you know, that, that, you know, either for better or for worse, there were some, some things didn't, you know, didn't really work. But the idea was a program that we did should be replicable, scalable, and transferable. So the idea being that if you look at programs in the past, even philanthropic things in the days when philanthropists were really aggressively entrepreneurial, um, it's usually the government, the private sector or the sometimes the philanthropic sector, particularly the overrich foundations, that can fund things at a scale. So the idea was, you know, so the, the interns and scholars program, which is very deeply sophisticated now, and you have training in the school and at the, on the job, and it's 100% employment for the, for the kids, and it's being adopted now by Wells Fargo, so that's a win, um, and, and those kinds of things. But other things, you know, uh, you know, didn't, didn't know, but, but one, I'll tell you one more, which is that um, during COVID, um, I, the day it started, I knew, and, we, and of course we had corroboration immediately, that the food crisis would be intense in Newark for lots of reasons. Newark, because it was so rich in the 20s and 30s, it's huge, and most every, no people who live there have, most don't have cars. You can't get around, and, um, and on top of it, uh, you, you, the, immediately, the people without anything, or the, everybody had COVID. Like people in the, the federal projects, are in, in, you know, multi-generational environments, um, lots of comorbidities, and so 
it, I, of course, what was the New Jersey liberal thing? It's food pantries. Everything's going to be a food pantry. It doesn't work in Detroit. It doesn't work in Newark. It doesn't work in many other places. So started Newark Working Kitchens. Um, and the idea was, in a nutshell, pretty simple. It was go to, it up, I think it was up to 37 restaurants. It was probably 20 or 30 at the beginning. And just said, we will buy 200 meals a day at $10 a piece if you keep, in some cases, up to 15 Newark workers working through this ridiculous crisis. Because you know, remember the business, everybody went home. So there was nobody to go to the restaurants. And the truth is, the working poor in America are mostly connected to the food industry now. Like in the 30s, it was laborers and stuff. Now it's the food industry, where you can't, even with a job, it's, chances are you can't make. So anyway, uh, and I said, we'll take our trucks you know, that get people at Penn Station and everything, and, which are not using. And we'll drive the meals to where it should go. And Marcus Samuelson here is, is our culinary advisor, and everybody knew Marcus at that point. And, um, and of course, I went thinking, this was probably the most fundable thing I'd thought of for middle of the road thinkers, but however you think about your kind of politics, because it was job retention and, and this kind of stuff. And I couldn't get other corporations to you know, play ball at all. Now, you know, Rihanna gave a million dollars million and a half, maybe herself. Audible put a lot of money into it. But we got raised sixteen and a half million um, dollars and fed one point six million people who got the meals delivered. And um, and uh, it was, you know, to you know, to, it was it was a, in many ways, a, you know, a big success. But it was because we'd already hired so many people from almost every block in Newark. We had an intelligence system to know school lunch goes away, which is that's the protein for a lot of families. And Newark's kids, you know that 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 lunch, and that wasn't there. So we knew there was going to be a massive, you know, food problem and stuff. So it's it's the things like that. I mean, it's not to it's not to toot horns because the truth is a lot of it has kind of imploded because of COVID, because you know the the corporate abandonment of the street and and the truth is even I'm going to say this to you that what also happened after George Floyd was that the centrifugal force of all of the these incredible people who grew up. And Newark, Newark, and we're now, you know, getting out of college. Every corporation was going to hire them and and pull them away from Newark now because it was now the spotlight was on them, and you know their lack of people of color and senior things were so suddenly. And I, it was kind of the, you know, from my point of view of trying to repatriate all this this talent, it was a uh, it was a negative. Right, amazing though. That was uh, that's, uh, what you have done in your firm has done is uh, amazing. Uh, how much time do we have left? Oh, no more. OK, save this one for last. <laughs> <laughs> I did. Yeah. <laughs> what advice would you give to, to today's aspiring entrepreneurs in this room? Yeah, I, I, I tried to speak in general that I think, um, you know, I mean, being entrepreneurial is kind of an interesting, um, you know, adverb. It's an like adjective. It's like it's you know, <laughs> um, you know, there's a way of just being being a self starter and being willing to, you know, be the leader of a project and all that kind of. I mean, any training you get on getting something done. But I, I think one of the things I've seen is that working on projects when you're a student. Um, um, Together and then you know being able to say you fin you got from here to here and did the project you, you learn a lot about your ability to you know have your ideas heard to you know make arguments that make sense and things like that. I always said that my background was the best background for starting a company, which is to be an inquisitive journalist because if you're the kind of journalist I was, you go in knowing that you don't know. Shit, you know, don't you don't know this stuff, and someone has to teach you the truth, and you have to get people to trust you enough to supplement what you don't know. You have to be fearlessly honest about what you don't know, and that is, you know, both the hum the humbleness and the, of, you know, it's amazing how many startups now that I know the startup company so well is is it's kind of egomaniacal. Usually, it's just somebody's, you know, belief in themselves, which is fine. But if you don't actually have the ability to supplement the expertise and stuff, so I knew I would need the most advanced technologist. I, you know, I'm not. I can imagine what technology should do, but I wasn't going to build the technology. So I've always said that you know the best thing was to basically, uh, you know, have an inquiring and relatively articulate way of 
you know, saying what you know what you want to get done, um, and then building his run. I think you know, of course, the joke with all of my generation of writers is they all said I sold out. I mean, it was like it's there's still you know, like you know, you can go into Facebook and go, it's like that I'm I'm at the top of the list of writers who sold out because because my generation they're so anti-capitalist that they would never start a company. I mean, they would never you know be, be anywhere near that kind of thing. But but I do think that, um, you know, I just decided to see, and you know, in my, because I was 20 years as a writer, about 27 and some years leading, leading Audible, um, I, did, I did try to bridge those, you know, those two, those two realities. Um, but I'd love to maybe, hear, is there, we have time for a question from the crowd? Yeah. Great. Yeah, if anybody has some really hard questions, that's good too. Microphone. <coughs> I'd like you to make sure you ask the question. Uh, ask the question in the microphone. Cool. Hi. Hello. My name is Perry. Hi, Perry. I have a question for you. Yeah. Was it easier publishing a book than making your company, which is Audible, public on a stock market? <laughs> and what is the challenges that you face for both of those? What a what a great great question. So, um, it was the first few years were very similarly unbelievably hard. And I had to kind of tell myself I wasn't going to fail like every, every morning. I mean, to write, um, uh, I was, a, you know, I was a magazine writer. I was like working all the time. I go from one to the other. But once I started writing books, um, it was kind of like when I realized what it was going to take to make a, a book about, you know, this or that, um, it was, it was kind of scary because you almost kind of disappeared because you had to write and, and research every day. And then you know the Audible side of things, um, it, it could have gone out of business for about 11 years, almost every day. So it was, uh, it was scary, but it was, it was similar. You know, like, you know, it's like everything else. Like, do I, can, I, can I get this done? And I was basically, you know, the fear of, of failure was pretty you know, kind of profound in both. But I, I do see the, them as, as both both hard, you know, hard to do. Now, the truth is now, anyone can publish a book. I mean, you can, whatever you want to call publishing, I mean, the platforms now have completely opened up so that literally anyone who wants to put words together can say they're an author and, you know, and publish a book. It was very much not like that when I started because the gatekeepers were really a narrow group of quite, um, you know, elite people making decisions on behalf of the culture as to who was good enough to get a book published. And, you know, there was a whole world of agents and stuff who tried to help you and stuff. So, you know, they were both, I mean, in both cases, you're living without a net, you know, the circus reference. And, uh, and that, you know, you got to have, and like, you know, I happen to have um, a, a wife of a gazillion years who just supported me consistently with these things that could have, you know, beggared the family, <laughs> you know, even when I had, the, I think the biggest difference was that I had kids in a house and a mortgage and everything when I started Audible, so, um, you know, it was a little different than when I was just, could have gotten killed 20 times going into war zones and all that kind of stuff as a single guy, but, but I think about this now more and more, because I kind of have, people all still come to me, it's like, are, is that Don Katz and that Don Katz are the same person? It's like every week. It kind of happens at the writer's side and the other, because it's pretty unusual to have both of them. But my challenge now is like, well, how do I take that and decide what to do if I, uh, you know, live as long as my grandparents? Because obviously, I outlive my parents. So. <laughs> Thank you. Um, first of all, thank you very much. I appreciate the talk a lot. Um, I'm familiar with the Nike book. I know what a fine writer you are. Um, but since I run the writing program here, I'm curious. Um, what you're working on now? Who are you reading? Ah, so, so um, that's a really, really, you know, really good question. So, believe it or not, I've been kind of rediscovered by outside magazines. So, when I was a writer, um, one of the magazines I was kind of one of the founding writers was called Outside Magazine, and uh, and it's been really, really interesting to um, to get back. And and a lot of the people are not in the game anymore who were you know with me, you know, in those days, but. Uh, but I found myself, and I was, they sent someone to interview me and stuff. So I've been trying to like take these two kind of scenes of life. But I've been basically, I've been giving talks at like this at universities. I've been playing around with you know what, you know, teaching or whatever, whatever. Uh, um, but 
you know, I'm, I'm always schizophrenic on my listening. I'm popping around by lots of things. There's a, you know, I'm listening to a new Audible original um, that's set in the uh, outlaw country music scene with, uh, man, you know, what's her name, Mandy Moore? Um, you know, she's, you know, what, what's her name? You know, Mandy, huh? she's, you know, she's the, she's the, she's the, the one of the big television shows and everything. Anyways, that, that's pretty good. And I believe it or not, I'm listening to an unbelievably scary book um, about longevity by a doctor named Peter Atia, A-T-T-I-A. And it's basically, you know, it's a huge bestseller. And it's about, you know, why people die of any number of things and the, and the like. So, so I, I, I kind of go, you know, I, I'm, I'm, I move around a lot. I'm, um, I'm reading a lot on uh, the the metrics of social policy and why is it that there's all these think tanks and people write so many articles that either perpetuate the government policy that is and or not and uh, and so I'm, I'm I'm thinking about that but I haven't kind of been diving back into you know writing per se yet I just I'm I'm, I'm thinking about it but but I do think it's really interesting how um, people are finding their own audiences and uh, and things like that and you know podcasting was not a thing when I started Audible. And uh, I got Robin Williams to do original programming for Audible um, five years before the word podcast came out. And of course, what's happened is it's, it took down all the barriers to basically having your own radio show and, um, or whatever you wanted to do. And, uh, and now there's over 7 million of them. And so it's, it's not a vast economy, and people are confused by how hard it is to probably be one of the people making a living from it, particularly on advertising revenue. Audible is pretty much from where I came from, which is that content you pay for is usually better than content you don't pay for. In the old days, network television was that, and then if you paid for cable, you got some better stuff, and you know, it's, it's always just been the way it is. But, um, but the podcasting thing does allow anyone to express themselves and find you know, some some meaning in that, in, in the, or the Substack environments and things. So, so some of the barriers are um, definitely gone down. I think the, the challenge is where do you look for getting better? So obviously not everybody has access to you, know, to you with you know, a lot of experience uh, teaching, you know, teaching writing and things like that. So it's, I think it's harder to get feedback. And, um, and let me say, the, the worst thing I've heard recently was from somebody at Google who is you know runs what's left of you know them figuring out how to meter their their you know the, the negatives of their social uh, environment and things like that and um, they they now know that people I'll just say you know the, the age of people in here are now reading the comments on a piece of content and not ever reading the actual piece of content to a majority. So you just think, like, are you kidding me? That's how you end up with these awful echo chambers. And you're not even reading the primary thing and giving yourself a chance to relate to it. And she, when I heard her say this and with some metrics, I thought, oh, you know, people should know this. And, like, it's, that's, you got to know. It's a terrible way to think about, you know, finding your reality is to listen to somebody else's comment. <laughs> Another question. Hi, good afternoon. My name is Shavika. So one of the things you mentioned recently that resonated with me was that you should find someone this quarter or this semester that impacts your life or cares about what happens to you. So what is an example of a mentorship relationship that you've had with a teacher or a professor that has positively impacted your life? That's a really good question. So I have had the weird experience of being rediscovered by my high school back in Chicago. And, uh, and now next Friday by my undergraduate <laughs> university. And so I'm, I'm having these weird kind of you know, moments of thinking back to that. But, um, but I, 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 had, uh, I had really transformative teachers. So I'll tell you why in the sort of, so I went into my junior English class in, in, in high school and this, this kind of the fuddy-duddy English teacher out of kind of central cast of this guy came in and he basically said, um, ladies and gentlemen, uh, I know that your, uh, your parents and your teachers have told you how deeply creative you are 
and that your refrigerators have had your poems and stories taped to them for your entire life. But said, here we are at a university that's matriculated. This is a huge university. Like my in New Trier, it was called. It was like there were 1,200 people in my graduating class. That's how big the, the high school was. He said, for my money, there's only been two substantially creative human beings who ever graduated from this university. And he said they are the poet Archibald MacLeish and the portrait artist Ivan Albright. He said, therefore, I'm going to teach you to write an essay. And he did. And in literally, it was this very specific system that I ended up using to write all my books and everything, to the point that um, other writers would come and I'd say, we hear you have this system, you know, and I would pass it along. So, but I think on the mentoring side, um, when um, the, having somebody like Ralph Allison care about you, it was just transformative to have this, you know, great American, you know, not only teach me one course, but then I qualified to have a, a tutorial with him. And um, he, you know, he basically taught me how to read differently and how to listen and encouraged me to be a writer, even though nobody from my background, I didn't know anybody whose, you know, parents or uncles or anything were, were writers growing up in Chicago. So um, um, he totally encouraged that. And then, you know, the things he taught me were like the intellectual backdrop to you know, to Audible. So, so that was a, another example. Uh, but, you know, um, I, I had a professor who basically walked me into that graduate school, London School of Economics, because he just cared about me and, and uh, was really helpful. And I, I didn't really want to go to law school. I didn't know what I was doing. Back then, you, you wanted to stay in school because um, I was old enough to get drafted, you know, to go into a war I wasn't going to fight. So uh, um, it, was, it, was, it was good. But it's, you know, it's, it's one of those things where, I mean, you might have teachers that, you know, don't necessarily have something to offer, but I think that effort to, I mean, I always would go see my teachers during office hours, and it was amazing, and I don't know if it's changed, but teachers would sometimes say, no one comes. You know, you're, you're, you know we're supposed to sit here, and, uh, and people don't show up. Hello, uh, my name is Katarina. Thank you for coming and talking to us today. Um, I found it really interesting, your point about NORC and entering the landscape of NORC with Audible. Um, and I was just wondering how that process was and in conjunction with Audible. And do you see entering any other cities along with NORC? Yeah, so Audible has 27 different people centers around the world here. So. Um, and you know this. If you look at the people principles, I think there's copies around. It's, it's. Um, I'll talk about that in a second. But um, uh, you, you know, this idea of activate caring. It was a particular evocation of of expectation around uh, what the company should stand for and stuff. So each unit um, has tried, but some of them are in like one of them is like right outside the. Harvard and Cambridge, Massachusetts. It's just there's not. It's not the same as moving into Newark. But we did move into um, Berlin about 18 years ago, which was a very historically challenged and um, and very much um, you know with a lot of, of of poverty and stuff. And 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 that had an amazingly equitable turnaround that wasn't you know as criticized for gentrification and things like that. So we you know can learn from that. But um, but you know the. The idea was mostly that you know the world headquarters would be in New York and, and try to do it. So how it was, you know, I was just saying it. It was, um, it was. I thought it was fantastic to go into New York. And the truth too is that we could build a really nice headquarters for you know it's just more inexpensive to move into a city like New York and the God knows going to Manhattan and you know and paying those kind, kinds of dollars. Um, so so. Uh, this people principles thing. So corporations often have slogan-like statements of their values. And um, they're often these one-liners. And half the time, they'll think like, do no evil, which you usually can date to when they did something really bad and got in trouble. So, uh, so you know, I had actually written about um, companies that should be remembered, which are really Outlaw. That one's called WorldCom, and one called Enron, and uh, and there I when when you know and I really liked the guy who started Twitter, and we had some funny 
you know, interactions over the years, Jack Dorsey, but when I saw Twitter's value statement, I thought, oh my God, they're exactly the same as WorldCom and Enron. I said, this is just, you know, I'm not going to do that. And I used to fight all the people in the, you know, the people organizations, you know, HR, you know, people, the people organization, saying, I, I said, I'm not going to write these one-off value statements, the ethics, values, these are things around philosophy and stuff. So finally in 2017, I did. And if you, if you want to get a copy, it says, it's the fine print that matters. I mean, they're not the slogans. It's the, it's the qualifications. And, uh, and it just, it's, a, it's, it's interesting because it's a way to think about what leadership could be. But it doesn't mean that you know you should feel bad about yourself if you're a, a good operator. You know, I don't know if you're in the business. Of, you know, operational things are, are really important. Execution, writing great code and stuff. But but being more thoughtful and imaginative was kind of part of it. And then you know a little bit more focused on the realities that um, you can impact society with these organizations, even though the other organizations next to you don't feel they. They have to, and like, you know, it, I have to say at MSU, reading more about your, you know, current president, it's pretty clear to me that the the institution that you know that you guys are in, um, are that people are saying like, what could what impact could a university have on society at another level, um, versus um, you know just you know, you know uh, training training the folks there. What what's your um, specialty at, at school? That's great. Incidentally, being an entrepreneur to start, you know, the best bakery in town, that's a very valid thing to do. Not every idea needs to be something that's designed to touch you know, tens of millions of people. Um, um, there's an, there's an anti-growth critique now, partly because of the behavior of the tech companies and, you know, like laying off hundreds of thousands of people and, you know, not necessarily doing anything good for people through social media and all this kind of stuff that why is what's the big deal about growth and why do you, why do all these companies you know say that growth is their measure and of course in my case I said you know I go around the world and I was like I get thanked for audible because I got jobs I wouldn't have gotten or my kids have succeeded when you know you could go on I'm, I'm not lonely and sad anymore I mean it's like you can't believe that it's really fun to me. And I thought, you know, if, if it's such a nice thing for people, why don't I want more people to experience it? So I always thought like, the growth was more in, you know, the embrace of it. But, um, but yeah, I think, you know, and look, I think the, the, also the good news is it doesn't cost as much to start a lot of startups anymore. I mean, you know, the, Audible had to build everything in its technology system from, from just build it all. And like, you know, now with the cloud and everything, the, the relative cost, uh, you know, of a, of a startup that has a technology base is, is pretty limited. Um, and, you know, there's others that are hugely capital intensive, but, uh, well, good luck. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> Hello? Thank really you. So much appreciation. Well, thank you. Here is a little plaque we have um, in appreciation on behalf of all of Montclair State. I mean, we this has been incredible sharing your background, your experience, your advice. I think this is something um, very memorable and um, well well use of your time. I know we didn't get to get to everyone's question. We are going to have a reception up on the second floor. I hope as many of you who don't have a class right now will be able to join us for a few minutes. Maybe another chance where you could um, come and ask your questions to Don. And again, yeah. thank you well, so much for coming. Thanks to everybody who helped make this happen. <laughs> thank, you. And thank you, of course, to Dennis Bone for facilitating this conversation. Everyone.